Howdy, today I'm Flipping Science looking at the factors that affect the spread of infectious diseases. Little weed apply, I'm little weed apply, straight from rubbish tip to you. Spreading disease with the greatest of ease, straight from rubbish tip to you. I'm bad and mean and mighty unclean, afraid of no one except the man with the can of more tea. Hate that word, more tea. Here's the science understanding that we're going to look at. To look at how infectious diseases can cause widespread health, issue, health issues for local, national, and or global populations, and in particular describe the interrelated factors that determine the spread of disease. So we're going to look at how uh, pathogens persist in organisms, transmission mechanisms, proportion of the population that's immune or has been immunized, and also how mobility of individuals affects the spread of disease. So there's many different factors that can affect how successful a disease is at spreading. Many of the factors um, influence other factors, so they can be factors adding to factors adding to factors, so it can get quite complicated to stop the spread of a disease. This can happen locally, and it can happen in small areas, in large areas, or in entire countries. And if, and if a disease is spreading in a particular way and is particularly bad, it can cripple entire countries. So let's have a look at some of the factors. So the persistence of the pathogen in host is essentially a measure of how long a person has the pathogen inside them and how long they can pass that on to other people. If the pathogen stays inside a host for a very short amount of time, or the person who is infected is infectious for a very short amount of time, that can limit the spread of a disease. So if something like Ebola, for example, um, people are infected fairly quickly, um, they die fairly quickly, so their opportunity to spread the disease is limited, um, depending, of course, where they um, are in the country. If they're inside a city, for example, then that could cause the spread to increase. I've got an example here with chickenpox. So chickenpox, a person may be infectious for about four weeks with chickenpox, but again, it depends on the person, how old they are, how good their immune system is, and so on. Some pathogens can stay inside the individual for a very long period of time, and that individual can be infectious for, a very, for that length of time. An example of this is HIV. So with HIV, um, you will start to feel the infection after a few weeks, but you will be infectious for the rest of your life for most people. So what that means is you're able to pass on that disease if you have direct contact with people in particular ways. As well as the persistence of the pathogen in the individual, um, the pathogen can also exist in the environment. So um, we use an example of something that can stay around for a very long period of time. Um, the bacteria anthrax produces spores, and those spores can be active for, a very, for many, many years in the soil before um, they get into a situation where they'll start reproducing and producing the bacteria again. If a... Uh, pathogen is particularly persistent in the environment, it can take a very long time to stop a big um, epidemic of a disease. A good example here is cholera. Cholera can exist for weeks in infected water. So once the water has been infected with the uh, Vibrio cholerae bacteria, it can hang around reproducing quite um, frequently. And while it's doing that, it can, um, it can infect many people who take in the water that's infected. So how long the pathogen stays in the environment can also be a factor involved in um, how effectively a disease spreads. Pathogens can be transmitted in a variety of ways, and depending on how they're transmitted, might increase or decrease their chances of being passed on to somebody else. So pathogens that have passed through the air or water are particularly easily transmitted amongst a population. The flu virus, for example, is passed through the air in droplets that people cough um, cough up or talk. When they're talking, they're producing droplets. So that flu can spread very, very easily amongst people by the air. We talked briefly about cholera just before, that passes through the water. So if the water is infected, then that can make its way around a large area very, very quickly. Pathogens that require direct contact are less, easily, less easy to pass on because you need that direct contact between people. And generally speaking, people have less direct contact with um, other people than they do just, you know, being in the air around other people. So if you reduce somebody's chance to transmit the disease, then you can reduce the number of people who are infected. One way of doing that is quarantine. So here we have a quarantine set up in a hospital. So the patient is in here, they're infectious, the people that are treating that patient are in suits, and those suits are thoroughly cleaned and uh, blocked off from the uh, person who is infected, so the people inside the suits don't get infected themselves. Down here we can see some suits that were first used in the Ebola outbreak not long ago. Um, these are positive pressure suits, so what that means is if the suit is burst, then air rushes out and that stops the pathogen from coming in. It then reseals itself, hopefully. The availability of immunizations and also natural immunity in the community can reduce the amount of um, exposure of people to a pathogen. 
If you've previously been exposed to a pathogen, you develop what's called resistance, and that's produced via antibodies that float around in your blood. And we're going to look at how that process happens a bit later on. What happens there is because you um, have these antibodies, your immune system is ready to fight the pathogen as soon as you're exposed to it. So it reduces um, the length and severity of infections, and it can also reduce the ability of the infection to spread. So some people have natural immunity to particular disorders, but one way of encouraging immunity is through a process called vaccination. This is where, or immunization, this is where a vaccine is given. So here's a little baby getting a vaccine. What happens in a vaccine is you are given a small amount of the substance that causes the disease, or parts of the substance that causes the disease, or a weakened version of the substance that causes the disease, and that stimulates your immune system to produce antibodies to stop you from getting sick. If you have over 95% of the population immunized, you have what's called herd immunity. And this is where the immunization of the majority of people prevents um, the people that can't get immunized um, from getting the disorder. We can see the effect of herd immunity in this animation down here. Where you have nobody vaccinated in the um, community, when one person gets the infection, they pass it on to other people, and it just makes its way through the number of people in the community. As you increase the proportion of people that have had a uh, vaccine, you're reducing the ability of the, vac of the uh, pathogen to transmit itself and also to cause people to um, get sick from it. So as more and more people are vaccinated, it's harder and harder for the pathogen to be transmitted because people are immune to it. Once you get to 95%, it just does not spread very, very far at all. So vaccination is very, very important. And what we're seeing at the moment is, particularly in rich countries, the amount of people being immunized is dropping slightly. This is due to a whole variety of factors. One of them is having access to information that isn't necessarily high quality. Um, some of it is related to parenting styles, and, a few, and the choices of parents affecting the choices of children. If we have a look at this map, we show some um, outbreaks of measles. Measles is completely immunizable. There, nobody should be getting measles because we have an immunization for it. Part of the cause of this is that in the late 90s, um, a scientist released a paper saying that the MMR vaccine, so that's measles, mumps, and rubella, he had a link to that and autism. So that meant that parents were stopping their kids from getting the vaccine in case their child got autism, which I think is pretty rough um, in many ways, but that's just my opinion. And that led to a drop of uh, people having MMR, which meant that we got an increase in the number of people having measles. It happens particularly in wealthier parts, often um, in Australia in particular. Uh, often very wealthy suburbs have low immunization rates. Um, this is an interesting thing. So here's a picture showing how effective immunizations can be to reducing the spread of disease. Um, here we have, so this is a few years old now, but we have the number of people before the vaccine um, before and then the number of people after who and reported infection. So here we see with diphtheria, we've gone from 21,000 people reported to zero. Um, if we look at some of the more famous ones, so here's measles that we were talking about, who, which is making a little bit of a com comeback. So half a million people infected before the vaccine, 61 people infected after. If we look at polio in the United States, so 16,000 people infected to zero post um, the introduction of the vaccine. And this is the story, but some of these disorders are coming back because people aren't vaccinating enough. The last thing we're going to look at is mobility of populations. People are much more mobile now than they used to be. Often in the past, people used to grow up in one place. They might not move very far from that place over their entire life. These days, lots of people are moving into cities, and where there's cities, there's more people, and where there's more people, there's more um, chance for transmission of disease. People also move internationally very, very frequently. And what this means is that a um, pathogen that's causing an infection in one location on the Earth can quickly be transmitted all around the Earth within a day, because that's how long it takes for a person to get from one side of the world to the other, normally on a long series of flights. And we saw this with the SARS outbreak in 2003. So the outbreak was centered in China and Hong Kong in particular. And Hong Kong is a big transit location for people flying in and out of Asia around the world. There's a really large airport that caters to lots and lots of planes from all over the world. So because of this, people that were infected in Hong Kong, um, they traveled around the world and they took that infection with them um, to various places. And so what they've set up was this uh, temperature checking stations in major airports all over the world. One of the signs of SARS was a fever, so they would see if people were warmer than normal by using infrared um, video cameras. They would take them out and they would um, isolate them and then test them to see if they were infected, and that way they could reduce the spread. 
but it meant the disease that was um, spreading in China and Hong Kong spread over the world fairly quickly. Um, so that mobility of people means that diseases can spread more, much faster than they used to. So today on Flipping Science we looked at the factors that affect um, how diseases are spread. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya. <coughs>